Pushkin. Hey y'all, it's Justin Richmond. Today we have on the show Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, the person who has one of my all-time favorite singer-songwriter albums, Bonnie Raitt. She's a ridiculous guitarist, gorgeous singer, wonderful interpreter of song, and maybe even underrated as a songwriter herself. Bonnie was offered her first record deal as a college student in 71, after a Newsweek reporter saw her play an early gig in Greenwich Village. But it took almost two decades before she peaked commercially. In 89, her 10th album, Nick of Time, debuted at number one and earned three Grammys, including Album of the Year. She built on that success over the next five years with two more hit albums and even more top 10 singles. In addition to her commercial success, Bonnie has been a devout advocate for preserving American blues music, bringing songs to the masses from little known but classic songwriters. On today's episode, Bruce Tedlam talks to Bonnie Raitt about her meticulous song selection process and the inspiration behind the tunes she wrote for her new album, Just Like That. Bonnie also talks about a somewhat awkward dinner she had with Prince and how her slide guitar technique will forever be tied to giving her brother the finger. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Headlam and Bonnie Ray. Now, my wife is a huge, uh, she loves Broadway, and she grew up with your father's recording of, I think, Carousel. The original cast recording, yeah. Yeah. So I admit, I was just watching some clips of him on on YouTube. First of all, you look a lot like him. My goodness. Thank you. Nobody ever says that. I have the same bump in my nose, and we have a broad Scottish face. So he's extremely handsome. I didn't quite get that, but he's any any resemblance I'm really proud of. Well, also, he had a good-looking head of hair, as, of course, to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, he all the way till he was, you know, passed away, he had a lion's mane. Now, my wife described him as he was Hugh Jackman, big strapping guy. Yep. Thank you for opening this interview, paying tribute to him, because I'm such a, I'm so grateful that I get to be his daughter and my mom's too, who is his music director. But they, uh, he was nobody better as a leading man. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about you, and then we'll come back to him. Uh, It's been six years since your last album. Yeah. What has that six years been like for you? Well, working backwards, we had the little thing called the shutdown, so we couldn't get my band together. We couldn't tour. We had to cancel altogether four tours of my own and three with James Taylor in Canada. We kept postponing them, and uh, that was frustrating for somebody that's been on the road since I was 20. And then I finally had a window when everybody was vaccinated and before the Omicron surge in June, and then we flew out, and it had been over two years since we played live, so I was really thrilled. So that that took care of uh, last year and the year before was just doing recordings from my house for various Democratic candidates and farm aid and gun control benefits and lots of musicians' relief efforts and You know, there was climate disasters that needed fundraising for. So I was able to be very busy, but I missed cranking up my guitar and playing (laughs) the drums. And then before that, we did a couple, we did a year and a half with James opening for him in arenas. We double billed, you know, sang a little bit on his set. He sang on mine. And before that, I did my usual two-year album tour when Diggin' Deep came out in 2016. It was a two-year extension because of the COVID and probably a two-year extension to work with James. So is it touring does not get tiring for you? You've, you've done it so long, you do it so ferociously, it doesn't get old? Well, if I was keeping the same lifestyle I was the first 17 years, I probably would have been flat on my back and not able to carry on the pace that I do. Mm-hmm. But as a, a accommodation to being older, we do we do two shows in a row instead of three. I used to do three and then one off and two and then one off. So we do two on, one off to rest my voice. Texting and email has made it really better for saving my voice. I actually played a, lo- a little bit longer show because I used to do a lot of fundraising receptions after the show too, which also wears out your voice. So right. I, I would say the touring part is... Fun to wake up in five cities a week. Fun to have an opening night every night to prove to the crowd that you're just as, if not better than you were last time, at least as good. 
And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to lie and say that it was as, it's as fun as it was the first few decades when we could stay up and party and go to clubs and sit in with bands and act fool, like fools. But uh, it's really satisfying to play the shows. So the extra, the 22 hours in between the shows is the challenge, but I've made it work for me. So I, you know, I do yoga. I talk to my friends. I'm not going to see as many of them on this tour, but, you know, FaceTime and texting and all that has made it a lot more easy to be in touch with your loved ones. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not draining if you take care of yourself and the bliss and the exaltation and the blast of a energy and tribal connection and joy comes from the stage shows so that i have to say that is the driving force and also making a living for 25 people that would like to continue to pay their heating bill mm -hmm. to get together with your band and to get it to do this album is it a matter of gathering all the songs together first what what part of the process is that yeah i mean i start calling songs down from ideas that i've saved over the years there's certain songs on this record that have been resting and waiting to be have their day in in, in court <laughs> <laughs> and i look in earnest all the time i'm always listening to maybe 20 or 30 songwriters that i really love the work of some of whom are well known and others are more obscure and i love the challenge of unearthing some unbelievably obscure jewel off of somebody's early record so it's it's a song hunt that unearths r b chestnuts current singer-songwriters, old catalog from other artists, lots of publishing submissions, and some of my own. So, you know, the, it, the process starts a couple of years before we actually get in the studio. And then, like the person that works on the term paper right before it's due, that's when I write my songs, <laughs> is right when we go, ready to go in the studio, I, I go, oh, I better finish this. Because I have really high standards, and uh, I don't make the cut often. What do you look for in a song? Has it changed over the years? I'd, I'd like to say that it has changed, but it not really. The main thing that is on my mind is not repeating myself. So finding something new to say at, at 21 albums is musically and lyrically very challenging. So I've covered every aspect of broken love, longing for love. I'm excited to be in love, you know, you, all of that issue. And then there's some societal kind of songs and there's just chestnuts from the blues and reggae and world music pantheon of great artists that I love. So I just kind of want to make it fresh for myself and for my fans and stretch a little bit and do some feels on the record that are going to add to my show when I go out on the road. I write my own songs kind of on assignment for what's what groove I'm missing and what topic I'm not covering yet. So I want to be I want to be new and interesting to myself, and I think that pays off for the fans, too. I found your own songs on this record to be very different. Now, your last album had one of your favorite songs of mine, which is The Ones We Couldn't Be, which I think is just oh. should be way, way up there for you, because it's a fantastic song. Thank you. Thank you. This is, at least two of the songs are very, very different, though. They're narrative songs, and I can't remember you ever writing that kind of song before. They're storytellers songs. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you first about the title track, which is uh, just like that. Yeah, I I deliberately wanted to do some something different like a story song. I mean, quite, quite a bit inspired by my friend John Prine. And even before he passed away, I had come up with the ideas to do these two songs that are kind of acoustic and story songs. I remember being very moved by The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry when I was a kid. And I love telling stories that, you know, have a twist a little bit in the ending, and I love reading those. I, I'm a big short story reader. But I, I found two incidents out in the world that really inspired these songs. And back in 2018, I saw a news program, an evening news that f finished with a human interest segment, as they often do, to balance the bad news with something hopeful. Mm -hmm. And the crew followed a woman knocking on the door of the gentleman that had received her son's heart as an organ donation. And they were capturing that on camera, and that was emotional enough. But he said, would you like to put your head on my chest and listen to your son's heart? And I, I lost it. I'm losing it now because it was so moving to me 
what that must have been like for both of those people. So I knew right then I was going to write a song about it, and I created a character that probably didn't even have any idea that her son organ was going to be donated. Normally you have to get permission, but she was responsible for the death of her child and was so mortified when she came out of her whatever coma or healing, she just left town and disappeared. And the song is about the recipient of her son's heart which, as, a, as a child, spending 20 years trying to find her so he could share that with her, that she gave him life and she gave life to them both. It's interesting that you flipped it from the original story. You made the woman the person in the house who didn't know this was happening. Yeah. There's a lot of YouTube videos, it turns out, of families meeting each other for the first time. That oh, is received. that right? Yeah, I didn't know about it. You know, when something moves me that much, I, 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 that was these are the first two songs I had to write for the record, and I knew that I had some other songs saved up that I was going to put in this time, but... That song was just very powerful for me to write. And uh, the idea of redemption and being able to finally have some grace and forgive yourself, mm -hmm. it, you don't have to be going through having killed somebody accidentally in a car to feel that way. And it's all the, all the ways that our lives are turned around by an act of grace and love from someone else. And uh, I, I learned about it from Angel from Montgomery and from Donald and Lydia and you know, all the great story songs of Dylan's early records and Jackson Brown and so many others in the folk tradition. I'm really hoping that it resonates with people because it sure, it sure did with me. How is it different writing a kind of story song? First of all, you're doing some finger picking, which we don't often hear, which is lovely to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, did it start on the guitar? Did it, did it start with the lyrics? How did you approach this song? Was it different? I wrote the lyrics when I came off the road, and I had a break back in 2019 in the, in the winter, and I I wrote both of these acoustic songs, and I knew that it was going to be on the guitar, because I normally write the songs like The Ones We Couldn't Be or All at Once, which is another story song that I wrote years ago. I think it's on Luck of the Draw. Mm -hmm. But I wrote the lyrics. They were, like, they, like people say, it's a bit of a cliche to say they kind of channeled through me, but that was, I had a a very kind of sacred intention with wanting to make this story real. And I knew I knew before I set the words down that it was going to end with this woman's life being changed. And it was fun painting in the details, you know, and just making it just right, because I don't write that often, so it was very satisfying. At no time was I under pressure. I waited to put the music until right before the album, and that is when playing the finger-picking style, which I knew I was going to do this song in, because I love Jackson's records and John Prine's first album. It's mm -hmm. like his others, but his first album is an absolute masterpiece. And it just shows the power of hearing Bob Dylan and Joan Baez when I was a kid and picked up the guitar and just the power of a voice in one guitar. And uh, I played that music, and John Prine was in my heart when I was writing that song. Mm -hmm. We should talk a bit about your musical background. You came from a musical family. You're mother a pianist, your father this Broadway star. What did you get from each of them in terms of music? I would say that because they were a, a partnership, she helped select his material for his concerts. She helped get his clothes together. He, You know, they were golfing partners. She was his rehearsal pianist, his music director, and directed the orchestra with her head playing the piano at his concerts. So I, I hear them together giving me the joy of music, both my brothers and I sitting there just in the other rooms of the house listening to my dad warm up and then practice you know, different songs for different functions that he was going to be doing, either light opera or the Broadway shows he was about to do to practice to get used to those and or his concerts. So we got a wide range of everything from Frank Sinatra to Nat King Cole and Tony Bennett to Ella Fitzgerald to Mahalia Jackson to classical music. So I, I got the love of a wide range of music from both my folks exposing us to it at a very young age. So my mom was also a really good singer and I wanted to play piano like she did and took lessons for five years and I just gave up because my teacher wouldn't let me play pop songs and I really wanted to play Motown and Beatles songs. And so I would do that at home and then lag behind when I was supposed to play my classical piece for him. So I jettisoned the piano and picked up the guitar, which I had started to learn when I was about nine years old, because I emulated my camp counselors. Every summer, my dad was in summer stock. We would go 
to this camp in the Adirondacks, all the way from L.A. to Adirondacks. And the counselors were caught up in the folk revival of the 60s. So Joan Baez, Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Kingston Trio, Odetta, those were heroes to me, and I taught myself to play off those records, which I begged for at Christmas along with my guitar. So I was a little folky and uh, ended up getting more interested in the guitar after I didn't take guitar lessons, but by then I had sort of enjoyed picking things out by ear. And so I got my love of the instrument from my mom and my love of singing probably from my dad. It's interesting you sort of combine them because you're a performer like your dad, but like your mother, you're constantly on the lookout for the right song. You're the manager at the same time. Yeah. And you've helped a lot of songwriters' careers by by looking for these things. That's a treasure for me because I, I happen to love the the songwriters' original demos of this thing, the songs they give me. I have a whole collection of them, but some of them wouldn't have the kind of a voice that would get a record deal. So I feel like I have a an obligation to be able to make these beautiful pieces of music sing and, and expose to a broader audience. I mean, not not only opening doors for them as a, in their career, but... I mean, I can't imagine being a, such a talented songwriter and have nobody hear your tune. So, mm-hmm. you know, I come from the Judy Collins, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra school of interpreting other people's material and making it my own. But you also write. Yeah. You're reminding me because I grew up in southern Ontario and Shirley Eichhardt used to. I was too young, but my sister used to go see her. So she was an example of someone whose career you really made. Yeah. I and mean, she had a pretty good... I think she had a pretty good following in Canada, and she's still making she was still making wonderful records. Uh, but yeah, that 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 song that she wrote kind of changed my life. Mm-hmm. But you don't sing it correctly because it's it's really something to talk about. Oh, there you go. Canadians don't understand your version at all. And she didn't sing like that on the demo no. either. So there you go. <laughs> no, that would be a very limited audience if she sang like that. Yeah, just Canadians, and there's not that many of us. I have a Canadian in my band now. He's from Winnipeg originally, but he lives in in Nova Scotia, Glenn Patcha, and he is a secret weapon of this new album. He's just an incredibly soulful keyboard player, but a great singer as well. So I'm a big, big fan of Canadian musicians and comedians. So was there one particular song that you listened to or you played in the guitar that sort of said to you, I want this to be my life? You know, I was plaintifully playing all those Joan Baez songs, all my trials, everything on her first couple of albums, Odetta songs, and then I just fell hard for Bob Dylan. Taught myself to play all of those in my room and sang so earnestly with absolutely no desire or need to play for other people. I mean, I led the songs around the campfire at camp as an assistant counselor. I'd help put on the talent shows on Saturday nights with kids doing musicals. But playing music for me was just a solitary, wonderful, emotional outlet. And I I just love the sound that the guitar makes when it's in your lap and through the sound hole and singing and playing. It's just so, such a release and you go so deep. So I can't really say there was one tune that made me want to go do it for a living. But one of the best inspirations was I took a semester off from college and, uh, my folks said, okay, you're on your own. We're not supporting you if you take a semester off. So I had to get a job. And I worked for the American Friends Service Committee as a transcriptionist in Philadelphia. And uh, I went to a club and I saw some young folk singer, a woman opening for the main act at a little tiny club called the Second Fret. And I said, you know what? I could be doing this instead of typing. You know, I like the AFSC, but come on, how much is she getting paid? So I found out I could just make pin money and support myself. And that's how my career took off. It wasn't really a desire to become a musical powerhouse or have a career in music. I was always going to be a social activist. And it kind of fell into my lap just because I happened to have the inspiration of seeing this girl that's, I said, but if she can do that, I can do, I'm at least that good, you know. And did you make as much money as you would have as a translator? Oh, I think I've done a little bit better. Than yeah. I've been a better <laughs> social activist as well. I had more reach. But yeah, I mean, right right off the bat, my um, I was very lucky to be dating somebody that was also a manager of some great blues artists that uh, the great Sun House, Mississippi John Hurt, 
And then Mississippi Fred McDowell, who I got to meet and hang out with all these legendary blues guys, which is why I took a semester off, because a lot of them were elderly, and I knew they weren't going to live forever. And I could always go back to college. So I had a, a kind of an opening slot at a, with a lot of these little gigs and, you know, the gas slat I opened for Fred McDowell and my hero, John Hammond. And I had no expectation to have the guy from Newsweek come down and give me a review. And next thing I know, I was getting record deal offers. Wow. So nobody more surprised than my folks and me. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that your first exposure to blues music? No, I became a complete blues fan at 14 when I, Joan Baez's Vanguard Records was like Mecca for me, you know, so anything on Vanguard I wanted to listen to. And the, the blues at Newport 64 had Reverend Gary Davis, John Lee Hooker, John Hammond, Dave Van Ronk, Brownie McGee, Sonny Terry, the great Mississippi John Hurt, and Reverend Gary Davis. It, it was a great record, and I taught myself to play. I'd never heard anything like John Hurt. I didn't know white guys could sing the blues, and I was a huge fan of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino, and Ray Charles. So I was already in the R&B soul music lane, like the Beatles were in the Rolling Stones. And when the Stones turned everybody on to Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, I signed up really just like the rest of us, you know. Now, when did the slide guitar start for you? I was about 15. I had heard about bottleneck guitar. I used to ring, read Sing Out magazine. I, I didn't have income to be able to go buy records or because I didn't take guitar lessons. I did know, though, that the that you tune the guitar to an open tuning because my grandpa had taught me some hymns on a Hawaiian lap steel, and he said, all you have to do is move the bar you know, from this position oh. to this, and you get the four chord and the five chord, and I went, piece of cake. So I soaked the label off a Coracidin cold bottle, put it on my middle finger, which is not actually very practical for slide. And I just tried to imitate what I heard on the records when I was about 14 or 15 years old, including Little Red Rooster by the Rolling Stones. Now, we should say B.B. King said you were the best, I think the best damn slide player around. So you've got lots of plaudits. Yeah, I can, I can go to my grave with that one right there. I mean, if I never got another review, that was the one that I <laughs> was not expecting and treasure. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you use the slide on your second finger, which is not unheard of, but it's unusual. Yeah, it's not optimum because actually it's great to be able to finger the other parts of the chords when you're not just playing the slide, you know, so it's, it's, it's more limiting, but... I had never seen anyone do it in, in L.A. I grew up in L.A. and we used to what we call flip the bird all the time. And I was a tough little tomboy and I had older brother. And, and I would do this this particular position with my hand, <laughs> which isolates your middle finger. And um, that's the finger that seemed really natural to me to, to put the slide on. And in fact, you, you hold, I won't make that finger, but uh, you hold the bottleneck on in the position that's actually the position I'm talking about. <laughs> so... Well, we've now discovered the secret of your great slide work, flipping the bird to your brother. Which I showcased on the David Frost afternoon show, my first show ever on TV, my bass player, Freebo, and I, like in 72 or something like that. And Robert Klein was the guest host, mm -hmm. and I had opened for him at, at a university show, and he played harmonica, as everybody knows. He had a great bit about, I can't stop my leg, and a spoof on being a blues guy. And he asked me about it, and I remember being smart alecky, and I was holding my finger like that the whole time in this <laughs> David Frost show. And then I went home and told, asked my friends if they saw it. And they went, oh, yeah, I can't believe you did that. Ah, youth. <laughs> yeah. You surprised yourself by getting a record deal. And then you had these critically lauded albums through the 70s. Tell me, what, what was that time like for you? I was having a blast. I mean, I built my following from opening for my heroes and folk clubs to being on festivals and being on the the one or the opening act at three o'clock. And next thing I know, I was back eventually being asked to headline a couple of nights. And then I drew poorly and then I drew better. And then I would open for Cat Stevens or James Taylor. And, you know, the benefit of having someone manage and book me that was already had acts that he could just call up and I was cheap. You know, I played my own guitar. I didn't need a band. I played a little blues. I played a little folk music. So I was not threatening to the main act. And 
Next thing you know, I was building my own following. So slow and steady, I got the record deal that came out. I couldn't afford a band till after my third album. And um, it was really touring most of the time to build up my following and mostly in colleges. So I've, I'm feeling the harvest of that, all that legwork and giving up personal life, you know, time at home because people are still coming to see me, you know, five decades later. And a lot of them write letters and say, I saw you at, you know, Case Western Reserve in 1976, or I was, you know, I was in the audience in Schwanksville, Pennsylvania. And, you know, all of these people that spent their 20s and 30s, they've stayed loyal with me. So I, my recollection of that time is six albums in seven years and 10 months on the road. Wow. And one woman and a bunch of guys. And I was like Gidget, you know, they told Gidget she couldn't surf and she was eventually accepted by the guys community. And I felt that way about being a leader of a band and playing lead guitar. I don't think of you as a Gidget type, maybe a Gidget who's flipping off everybody. Yeah, I went from Gidget when I was 13 or so to Amanda Blake, I thought was really great because she had red hair and she didn't have to get married and she owned the saloon. So that I, it was not lost on me. I went, you know what? <laughs> I'm not the wife and mother type, but I'm just going to. It was a dream come true to be handed a career like that. And I, I've never had a day where I know, don't know how lucky I am. You also showcased some female composers earlier in your career, people who don't have a big following now, like Sippy Wallace and Yvonne Blake and uh, Calypso Rose. Was that deliberate on your part? Was this something that interested you about blues history? Well, to me as a blues fan, the classic blues singers were just all fantastic and so different. But I loved that Sippy wrote songs from kind of a, as a young feminist in my early 20s, you know, in the late, late teens, to hear, you can make me do what you want to do, but you got to know how, you know. It was just so saucy and women be wise, keep your mouth shut, don't advertise your man, you know. All the feminists were going, you know, how could you say that sisters would never steal each other's men? I said, what What world are you living in? <laughs> you know, you know, if you talk about your baby, you tell me he's so fine. Don't be surprised if I come up, check him out sometime, you know. So Sippy, I had no idea that she was still alive. And so to actually record her songs, because I loved her music above all the classic blues singers, and find out that she was alive and become friends with her at the Ann Arbor Blues and F Jazz Festival and go on and tour together for 15 years it was just an incredible gift. So, you know, something that I had an intention that was musically driven ended up being a benefit culturally for me and for her just to expose her to a wider, wider audience. And just that is a great joy for me to take people that are underappreciated. I mean, Calypso music is one of my other favorites. And Calypso Rose is a huge star in that world, and, and Van Dyke Parks is the one that turned me on to that song. So on the record, I was working with him and Lil George, and you know, we did that song, What's She Gonna Do? If you're, I, I can't repeat it here, but it's a little bit of some double entendre lyrics, as it often is in the blues and Calypso music. What was Sippy Wallace like? What was she like as a person? She had an incredibly great laugh, which she loved to laugh, loved to kid around, but she was very religious. And, you know, I was meeting her in her 60s or late 60s. She had recovered from a stroke and she was, you know, had been in a wheelchair for a while, but was walking slowly. And uh, she was only going to do gospel music after she stopped. You know, the, the whole blues industry went downhill when there was the Depression and the Second World War. They needed the vinyl for other things. And the black music industry was the one that took the hit. So she really was settled on just playing in church. And she played organ and piano in the church and led the choir. And uh, she heard that I had done one of her songs and her manager who had re kind of brought her out of retirement and nursed her back to, you know, the idea of playing in public again after her stroke. She was only going to do a gospel song at the Ann Arbor Blues and Jazz Festival. And I was going to pay tribute to her. And then we rehearsed it in my trailer. We were I sat soprano saxophone and my guitar singing her own song and she started to rock back and forth and she said, well, maybe I'll just do that one song. <laughs> so nice. She was playful and wise and I asked her lots of questions about men, about what it was like to be on the road when she was a young woman with mostly men. I mean, did she get hit on? Did they treat her with respect? What was it like to be widowed by her husband dying so relatively early and did she miss being married? And 
you know, I asked her about Jesus and asked her about racism and Jim Crow. And it was an incredible to have her as my kind of like a grandmother or an elderly aunt to give me a window on her world musically and culturally. Did it help you in those years when you were the woman on the road, usually opening for men and I'm sure getting hit on and... Well, I was just my own boss, you know. I grew up with my dad having to, my dad mostly waiting to get another show. I mean, he would he would steady book himself in the summertime on the very lucrative uh, one star at touring in Carousel, Oklahoma, pajama game. It shows that there there's a circuit of regional theater in the summer. It's called Summer Stock. And he would do eight shows a week and for three months and just be out there. No air conditioning. Most of them are in tents in the round. But basically, he, he didn't have a chance to get a new sh- He couldn't generate a new show for himself. And I just noticed that. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna, if I'm going to do this, I want to have total control over what I record and when I release the record and what the ticket prices will be and, you know, who I open for and who opens for me. And so I, um, I was much more hands-on self-managing. You know, I needed a booking agent and a tour manager, but the rest of it I handled. So I think Sippy was more of a woman of her time. She was very young when she started, and then I think guys just took care of her, you know, the, the guys, the music directors, but they were always very respectful. She didn't have, uh, I think she probably got married early to be able to be protected. Mm-hmm. You talked about sort of being in control of your own career, but then in the 80s, your career took this, well, I'm not sure your career even took a dive. Maybe record companies just changed their ways, Uh, but Warner Brothers dropped you Mm -hmm. at the same time that I think Prince was interested in working with you. Well, within a few years later, yeah. I mean, in, in answer, I, I kind of veered off when you asked me how I felt about the 70s and my albums. You know, I would have liked to have them promoted more. I mean, I always made went out of my way to have a good single on the record. Mm-hmm. But I think because I didn't have a manager and I didn't want to be uh, directed at all or told what to wear and I didn't care about having a hit single. I mean, my deal with Warners was predicated on being an album artist. So it's something that, in, in Americana music now, it's just not even thought of. You know, if you straddle genres, and you you know you don't want to have a you don't need to have a commercial single off your record. That's people don't even blink now. But back then, they wanted you to be able to promote a record. And when the record business took off with Rumors and Thriller and Miami Vice soundtrack, these were billion selling records. And those of us that were more moderate sellers just got pushed a little bit to the side, and they'd rather sign somebody else that could bring in more bang for their buck. They were also absorbed by big corporations, you know, Warner Electra Atlantic consolidated, Warner Communications took over. There was a different set of priorities in the 80s. So, uh, you know, they dropped T-Bone Burnett and Van Morrison and Arlo Guthrie and me, and, you know, we weren't bringing in the big bucks. So Mm -hmm. the 80s weren't real friendly to my kind of music. It wasn't a great political decade. There was this war in Central America. It was a lurch to the right politically and um, the consolidation of the record business. And it wasn't until the end of the decade that the college radio and album-oriented rock and VH1 came along. And, you know, Tracy Chapman had a number one record. Edie Burkell, Robert Cray, the fabulous Thunderbirds. My kind of music was having hit a hit play, so... I w- it was a good time for me to come back into the four, but I never expected to have that huge success. I don't think anybody did. But you were back playing solo shows, is that right? You didn't have a band at that point? I played with my guitar player who backed up on bass and sang harmony, and we would do that in the months when we weren't with the band in the summer. And Prince approached me a f- couple of years after... Um, I'd been dropped because I had a record ready to come out and a tour with Stevie Ray Vaughan. I had to cancel it. And um, he said, you know, you were treated badly. Why don't you come over with Paisley Park and make a record with me? And we ended up trying to work on some things together, but he had done the tracks all of himself in a key that I don't sing in and lyrics that I couldn't relate to. So we we were going to work together again in the future, but our schedules did, just didn't work out. Was he a, a nice guy to work with despite everything being in the wrong key. 
he was really as fascinating as you read about him. He's very shy. You know, when you ate dinner with him, he was like, I felt uncomfortable because I'm pretty extroverted. And he was just really self-conscious about looking down at his food and putting the food in his mouth. So it was kind of endearing. Mm -hmm. But what a badass, though. You know, it's just the combination of shy and sexually so forthright. And, you know, his the thing that all of us musicians have in common is our love of music. So that's what we just, every time that we got together was just a couple of long evenings in LA and once in Minneapolis, just huge floor to ceiling screens watching this, you know, staple singers and Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, we just were stone music fans and that's what we had in common. He was a great, great guy. Did you ever just sit across from him and play guitar? I played guitar on some of the tracks that he had, put together for us to possibly, for me to try. And I, so I did that. And, uh, but it was a thwarted, it, it wasn't a fully realized collaboration because I told him I appreciated the interest, but I wanted to be 50, 50. And, and there was some things happened where, you know, I was injured and I had to get over a thumb injury. So we had to postpone the sessions. And so he went ahead and just got some songs from his vault or wrote some songs that he thought I would relate to, but they just weren't in my wheelhouse. So you know, just I wish we could have worked together because I have great admiration for him. I do want to talk about some of the songwriters you've worked with and just your first encounters. And I have to start with John Prine. Can you tell me about meeting him or encountering his songs for the first time? Yeah. I heard his, his first album on Atlantic, his debut record, and I was just absolutely floored. And I don't know when in the timeline, but I was playing The Gaslight and he was playing The Bitter End and we ended up meeting in New York City in the, in the village. And soon after, we both played the Philadelphia Folk Festival together. And we just forged a friendship right away that was absolutely immediate. He was a fan of mine. I was a fan of his. Was Angel the first song you did of his? Yes. I knew of the first time I heard that song on his album that I'd be cutting that song. And I was just a- astonished that someone of his age could crawl inside that woman who, in that longtime marriage and just so beautifully and succinctly, I mean, he's a, I, so much has been written, especially since he passed, but I mean, the masterpiece of economy of that song and how every line is just laden with meaning, and you don't need to go in, it doesn't have to be a long story, it's just immediately there. And I, I sing that song for all the women, when I was a young woman, for all the the women that are stuck in marriages and can't leave if they wanted to try a different kind of life or get a job or just have someone to talk to, you know, and just not. I, I remember seeing the film, The Bridges of Madison County, and thinking that that so perfectly described what Angel from Montgomery was about without giving it away, that moment when she makes a decision to not follow her bliss. Mm-hmm. So I sing the song for my mom's generation. I sing the song for women around the world that don't have the choice to get stay single or get out of a bad marriage or get an education. So it's it's taken on very mythic proportions for me. Another writer I wanted to ask you about was Richard Thompson. Oh, I'm so glad. He's another guy that how could he write that dimming of the day in his early 20s, you know. Mm-hmm. Give me a break. He's one of the greatest ones we have. I'm a huge fan of his and he's as fascinating a person. He, he has a wonderful memoir that he just put out. And uh, it's really uh, his Sufi religion, his his path going to the Sufi uh, spirituality mm-hmm. mixed in with all of the, the uh, wonderful behind the scenes of what it was like to be re- to creating an entirely new form of music by electrifying and, uh, and making originals of Celtic traditions. It's just, there's nobody like him. He's absolutely brilliant. You know, it's one of my fantasies that you do an entire album of Richard Thompson songs. What a cool idea. You know, Down Where the Drunkards Roll or Walking on the Wire. Misunderstood, Persuasion. I mean, there's so many that I love. You could do uh, 52 Vincent Black Lightning from the point of view of the woman. Oh, my God. That would be very original. That would be mighty, wouldn't it? I mean, it's a woman with red hair on a motorcycle. I don't... uh... I'd have to sing it about a guy with um, black hair on the motorcycle, but... You could do it any way you wanted. That's my elevator pitch. Well suggested, because I just think he's phenomenal, and he keeps growing, and he's so prolific, and 
if it was just his songwriting, that would be enough to put him in the top. But his singing style and his topics and his guitar playing, I mean, really, thank you for reminding me to, so I could just live in that moment with him. And you're a big Mose Allison fan. I am a huge Mose Allison fan. Now, have you done a lot of his songs or? I've only done Everybody's Cry and Mercy. I did that on my third album in 73. And I had become a headliner. I first opened for Jackson Brown, my first national tour in 74. One woman and 13 guys in both bands on one bus. It was 50 cities of that. It was incredible. But uh, after that, I was able to headline, and I invited Tom Waits to come and open the tour. So, And somewhere in there, I asked Mose Allison if he would like to do, it was either three or six weeks together, probably three of colleges. And I know it was an unusual idea, but he, I said, Mose, you know, we could, you could make good money. I'll give you, I'll pay you more than what you're asking. And you can open up this whole market that needs to know about you. And he said, yes, so selfishly, just to be able to sit in the wings and listen to him every night was incredible. And we were very good friends all all the way through his life. I hear ideas of his sometimes in your music, including on this album. Mm -hmm. But other than the one song, I know you haven't haven't covered him. My older brother brought a record of his, you know how you idolize your siblings sometimes when they're older. And he, he was dating someone from Bennington College, and we came back to... Christmas vacation, and he brought the birds and Freddie Hubbard and John Lee Hooker and later Jimi Hendrix, but he brought Mose Allison's record. That's where I first heard it. I was like 16, and I just couldn't wait to be a beatnik and go to New York and hang out with guys with turtlenecks <laughs> and berets and goatees. <laughs> and I just think Mose is the coolest blues guy I've ever heard in my life. Incredible. So the 80s, your career, or... Warner's career wasn't going so well, let me put it that way. And then you had this incredible tear when you went to Capitol, and they signed you for some small deal for 150000 or something. Not even that, 125 I think. But I, all wow. we needed was the budget. That was the budget we were going to make the record with. Well, that was the best $125,000 Capitol Records ever spent. Well, that, what did they know? I mean, they knew that if we were going to make a really simple record that it probably doesn't cost, you know, I just make records live mostly. It doesn't, it shouldn't cost that much to make. I don't do big productions or anything. Mm-hmm. And um, Joe Smith signed me to Warner's in, in 71 and he signed me to Capitol in 88. So that was part of it. But to have a new label, some of which are people that, some of, some of the people came over from Warner's with Joe, and, but they had something to prove. They knew that I had was really changing my life and wanted to make a really great record. And my pairing with Don was was real kismet. It was great. What else changed, do you think, that made it suddenly possible for people to hear you in a different way? Well, number one, I think it was a switch in label and have a very enthusiastic team that had something to prove. VH1 it was just starting, and I would have never been played on MTV because I was 40 years old. So and not a babe. So VH1 needed some new artists to showcase their new adult channel. You know, I don't know. You can't call it an adult channel. What can you call it? Mature. I don't know what to call it. It's just not the kids channel. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that I was, uh, I got sober in 87 and was much healthier and happier and had written some songs and, you know, had a particularly good batch of tunes and, and a great partner in Don Was. And uh, all of those things, coupled with the fact that radio actually had formats that would play me, that is a huge change from the middle of the 80s and before. There's no way that Tracy Chapman would have won album of the year in 1981, or Edie Brickell or the Thunderbirds or Robert Cray having big hit records like that. So things have changed, and the, the burgeoning Americana scene kind of was happening right about that time. Are there still outlets that are going to play your new stuff that are going to say, here's the new Bonnie Raitt? Yes, I think so. I mean, there's only, I mean, I don't get mainstream play, I don't think at all. I've only had a couple of songs that crossed over in the in that nick of time period with I Can't Make You Love Me and Have a Heart Maybe. And I think Thing Called Love was, was a radio hit, but only on the adult album AOR, adult 
oriented radio, whatever. There's AC and AC light, adult contemporary and adult contemporary light. Those stations that would play Nick of Time wouldn't play Thing Call Love and vice versa. And I think nowadays there's tremendous competition, not just for styles of music, but for generations of music. I mean, every four years there's another 30 artists that are vying for the same radio time. So I'm thank God I got my foot in the door in the 90s because I'm still played as a legacy artist on, you know, I, I don't really study the formats of the stations that play me, but I just know that there's independent, what we call FM stations that have been incredibly loyal to me and um, probably get a little play on college stations and maybe even country stations. I don't know. But there's a circuit that plays me just like they play John Hyatt, John Prine, Jackson Brown. Mm -hmm. Thank God. It's a little bewildering to me that I mentioned the song off your last album, The Ones We Couldn't Be, which, you know, to me, I don't see any reason why that's not as big a hit as I Can't Make You Love Me. Oh, my gosh. You know, no one's ever mentioned that song, really. Really? No. I mean, I'm very proud of it, but its I just figured it's too personal. You know, I have a, a three or four songs like that that are on the keyboard and kind of contemplative you know, not universal themes, but very personal. And they probably don't have the production or the musical style to cross over and be a single like that. I mean, there's a beautiful song called Wounded Heart a couple of albums before that I thought was just a massive deepening for everybody to listen to. It's by Jude Johnston. But thank you for appreciating that. I just, I wish in a perfect world that those, every every ballad could have a lot of showcase. So, You've continued to put out albums, great albums since, like Fundamental and Slipstream, which I think did very, very well for you. Mm -hmm. How was this new album different for you? Obviously, the world was different. Yes. uh, With COVID. Was there a different thought going into this record? It's always the same for me. I find 10 or 12 best songs I can find and write some that say things that I can't find from other people. And I've got the same focus of looking for new things to say and new ways to say it and stretch if I can and have a couple of surprises for people. So it wasn't really different. It's just we just had to wait a long time before I could get in the studio. And, uh, you know, there was no assurance that this year was going to actually, the tour that we booked a year ago for this year, we didn't have any idea. And I guess we still don't know if it's going to 100% happen, but it looks pretty good. So I called up Mavis Staples and I called up Lucinda Williams and I said, would you be my special guest? So, so the, the tour is kind of split with them, each one of them doing a different part. And um, the sales have been great so far. So going into this record, I just knew that I wanted to stretch a little bit and do those acoustic songs that are not about my personal life. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted to write a song about recovery and just not just recovery, but the way the devil is on your shoulder trying to urge you to do the things that you know you shouldn't do and how to, what a slippery slope that is. And musically, Waiting for You to Blow, which is, is the music to that idea, that has some of the more adventurous musical arranging that I've ever come up with. So mm-hmm. I'm proud of that. I'm especially proud of that one. And then Living for the Ones is the song I wanted to write about what we just went through in the last couple of years and all the people that we've lost. So I got a little bit of everything that I needed to say in there. Okay. Well, you're anticipating all my questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, which is good. No, no, that's that's absolutely fine. But I do want to ask you <laughs> about the other slower song, the, the story song on this, uh, which was Down the Hall. Tell me a bit about that. Well, that one was uh, great journalism by the New York Times. Again, the Sunday Magazine has some of the most incisive, unexpected stories, and I make room in my life to read cover to cover, unless I'm too blown out by reading about war and poverty and starvation on a Sunday morning. So I saw this photo essay and a beautiful article in the New York Times Magazine Sunday paper in May of... 2018. And I just was devastated when I finished. I I just wept. I put it down and I just wept. And I don't even know if I went outside again that day. And it continued to stay with me and move me so deeply. And I knew that it was going to be a, what I wanted to write a song about. 
And it, it had to do with a prison hospice program where in Vacaville, California, they have a, a program where volu- you know, prisoners can volunteer to be of service on the hospice ward. And the photos that accompanied the interviews and the writing of Salika's incredible writing for the piece just it was one of the most beautiful marriages of journalism and heart and human interest and redemption and grace. And those are the things that in the last couple of years with the wrenching polarity and vitriol and climate nightmare and suffering and migration and Black Lives Matter, it's, it's unprecedented. And I don't know how to handle it. So I was really moved by the impact of this story. And I knew I wanted to write a song from the point of view of someone that would make that decision that, you know, for no gain, no shortening of his sentence, no money, just saw a guy being wheeled into the hospice ward and asked the nurse if his family comes in at the end. And she said, most of them don't have anybody. And he just, you know, what else has he got to do? He didn't have to volunteer, but I just put myself in his place and what it would be like for him to get over the tribal segregation and animosity of one population in the prison community to, has for the other. And they, in the hospice ward, everybody's the same. We all need human contact and love and care and someone to be with us at the end. And I just wanted to be able to write songs, these two songs about redemption and grace and forgiveness and uh, I think it's medicine for these difficult times. And they're beautiful songs. Thank you so much for talking. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating what I do and making these great suggestions as well. Thanks to Bonnie Raitt for talking about the inspiration behind her new album, Just Like That. You can hear her new album and all of our favorite Bonnie Raitt songs on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez, with engineering help from Nick Chafee. Our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. <laughs>